and you know that's why we're here. And uh, I want to thank Pastor for having the confidence in me to to bring a word. And pastors sometimes need a little break. I know I need a little break sometimes because of all my ministry. I need to soak it in sometime. I need to be preached to. I need to I need to just relax and, and be a soaker. I'm not a soaker uh, usually, but I'm, I'm, my uh, personality is certainly an amped up. You know, the Facebook thing, it says, describe, I mean, it'll give you three or four words, and it says, pick one that describes you. Have you done that before? One was compassionate, one was love, one was uh, something else, and one was amped. <laughs> and I pushed amped as my word to describe me. Boy, I got about this many of Facebook saying, you're right on with that. You're pretty amped up for God, right? <laughs> I mean, I was amped up for the world but before I came to know Christ. I was really good about what I did as I was not a Christian. I put a lot of energy in not being a Christian and doing the things that people that are not Christians are doing. And God knows my personality. And He's using that personality. And just turn to, you know, just understand that God created you just the way He wants you to be. Right. But He loves you too much to stay, for you to stay where you are. Yeah. Amen. And... I remember when I got saved, the the word became the, the it. I started studying right away. You know, you know a real baby when a baby craves for the milk bottle? If a baby's not craving for the bottle as a baby, something's wrong with the baby. Now, a Christian that gets saved, you can always tell a real Christian from a Christian that's just kind of plain Christian when they crave the word like a baby craves the bottle. I watch babies all the time down at our ministry and I watch them suck on that bottle and if they don't get that bottle they scream and they don't scream like eh. they go ah! I mean it's that nasty scream right? we should be screaming like that when we don't have our bibles and so, uh, so when I, I fell in love with the Lord first of course he saved me by grace through faith alone in Christ alone I fell in love with the Word, started reading, started reading, started reading. And through knowledge, I started growing and growing and growing like the baby on the bottle. And I like this passage I'm going to bring to you today because it's about not looking back. Say to your neighbor, say, don't look back. Don't, don't, look, don't look, back. look back. You know, this is the thing, passage, the Apostle Paul, the great Apostle Paul, was writing this in Philippians to the church at Philippi, Philippi, they was, he was probably in, in prison. He had three mis missionary journeys, and he wrote most of his epistles or letters to the church, and they circulated all around. So it wasn't just one church reading one time. They circulated around, and he knew that God had uh, commissioned him to write through, through the Holy Spirit's uh, unction. He was all scriptures given by inspiration of God and profitable for doctrine, reproof for correction, for instruction in righteousness. How many of us need some of that? Yeah. I need some of that. I need all of that. I need to, I need to be reproved, corrected. I need instruction in righteousness. But he, he writes these words that I think, and especially this time of year, that means as a Christian so much to us. Philippians 3. Read all Philippians. It takes 25 minutes to read it. It's, it's, it's an incredible letter of, of, of encouragement and of instruction. And it only takes about 25 minutes, depending on how fast you read or whatever. He, and he, after, he closed about four times. What I liked about the Apostle Paul, I won't do that. I won't say that. And for the fourth time, I'm closing. I'll try to just close one time. Is everybody getting that joke? No, I guess not. But... Um, I wanted to start with Philippians 3.12. It's in the New Testament. We got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. What do you got after that? Acts. Acts. Romans. 1 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians. You got Galatians. Ephesians. Ephesians. And, and Philippians. Remember Galatians, Ephesians, and Philippians is Gentiles eat pork chops. <laughs> so you can kind of get that in your mind. Somebody said, well, I don't know. Why do you tell people what, where, where a, a, a book in the Bible is? Well, you know what? You might be a brand new Christian and not know where anything is. Yeah. You know? I've seen you know, a brand new Christian. I said, just it's in the New Testament. Go to the right. And it'll go to the uh, content. So that's why I say it's in the New Testament, Philippians is. And, he, and he, he starts off with some great, great rejoice in the Lord. See, the first thing. Finally, brethren, rejoice in the Lord. 
So let's say, rejoice in the Lord. Come on, say it together. Rejoice, rejoice in the Lord. And that's through trials and tribulations too, right? Yes. Is that just when everything is good? No. He was in prison. John the Baptist was in prison. I mean, back he was in a dungeon. And when I preach in prison, and I preach to the ladies in prison, their environment was a lot different than a dungeon. Amen. A dungeon was a hole in the ground underneath a, a pilot's castle, and he did everything in one place, if you know what I'm getting at. Yes. And so he, he knew that there were some weird, unorthodox, false teaching going around because what will the adversary want to do to people? Just get them off the track a little bit with correct doctrines. Doctrines everything. Doctrine is everything. Good theology is everything. Yeah. Some people say, ah, oh, doctrine, uh, you can believe this. Debatable doctrine, different thing. But when you want to die on a hill with doctrine, it's salvation. It's by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. That's called sola fide in the Latin. There is no way that that could ever be debated. There's some things you just die on a hill for, don't you? Yes. And there's other things you just leave, put it on the shelf, is what I say. But I want to read a little bit from verse 12. Watch this. Now that I have already obtained it, it's not that I have already obtained it or have already become perfect, I press on so that I may hold of that for which I was laid hold of by Jesus Christ. Now, what does that mean? He says... I ain't got it figured out yet. I'm an apostle of God. I'm doing miracle signs and wonders. And you know what? I'm in my sinful body still. I have a sin nature, but positionally, through Christ, I have been made perfect. Amen. So turn your neighbor, in Christ you're perfect. In Christ, in Christ you're perfect. Now he was talking to some people that said you can, you can obtain spiritual perfection while you're on this world. That is false doctrine. There's no way. Let me tell you, tell you what. I promise you this from Scripture. By the time you die, if you're a Christian now, by the time you ch check off, you're going to sin again. Yeah. Let's call your sin nature. Mm -hmm. Is that true? Yeah. yeah or, or, true. Oh, there's a bunch of angels in here. Excuse me. That's true. Okay. That's true. Am I the only one? <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> I want man. Y'all make me feel bad. Mm -hmm. But he said, but there was people like the Gnostics that believe knowledge would obtain spiritual perfection. The Pharisees believed through works, through the works of the law, they could obtain spiritual perfection. And they, they put it in people's face and they made all these prayers so people could hear them and they would tithe to the nth degree. And, and, and the Apostle Paul said, hey, I'm an apostle. He said, I don't got it all figured out yet and I will never ever reach spiritual perfection on this earth. Now, yeah. there's some good news. Hold on, y'all. He says, but I want to obtain it. My goal is to be more like Christ while I'm here, even through my flaws and shortcomings. How many of you have a few thought flaws and shortcomings? I have a lot. Since you're the most honest person. You get a reward in a minute. You're the most honest person I know in this room. And so he says, I, I don't. I don't pretend that I have obtained it all. I don't pretend that I have this spiritual perfection and know everything. He says, that I don't know, but I'm going to press on. My goal is to be more like Christ. If you're a Christian, your goal is to be more like Christ, not more like yourself. Mm -hmm. Now, use your personality. Use your gifts that God has given you. But if, you don't, if you're a Christian and you don't want to be like, more like Christ, who do you want to be more like? Christ was perfect in every way and word, thought, and deed. The perfect law keeper, the sinless son of God. So he says, I press on so that I may lay hold of that for which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. He got saved. Yeah. He's going to heaven. God gave him a commission. He knocked him off the horse and saved him. Lord, is that you? Yeah. And he said, by the way, I'm going to save you. And you're going to go through a lot of trouble. That doesn't sound like something I want to sign up for. You know, when I hear preachers say, come to Jesus and all your problems will be solved. Yeah. <laughs> Where is that in the Bible? I, I don't like, I guess it's not there. I 
I've looked for it many times, by the way. <laughs> in fact, the apostles, when they became saved, when their lives became more difficult, do you agree? I mean, I don't, you know, Apostle Paul out in the ocean for three days on a piece of driftwood, you got to really be close to God to, to survive that time, don't you? Amen. And some of us are hanging on that piece of driftwood right now. Some of us are going through that, that storm in life. But hold on, y'all. The encouraging part I ain't even gotten to yet. I'm just setting it up. Wait till y'all get to it. I'll start preaching in a minute. But he says, I don't have it all figured out. And I haven't reached spiritual perfection. But I do want to be more like Christ. Even though I mess up. You know what I thought, think his problem was? I think he was. He had a, that thorn in his flesh. Nobody really knows what it was. Everybody speculates it's physical. Much more. I think it's much more severe than that. Spiritual trauma is much more difficult than emotional or physical trauma. I believe that he was, and we don't know what his thorn is, because you and you and you and you and you always, we, we have one of our own. So if, if it was specified specifically in the Bible, it would just be that. Yeah. I got my own thorn. Now, it might be different than your thorn. It might have been that he was jealous of all the false apostles getting all the attention. It might have been he had a jealousy problem. We don't know what his thorn was, but he had one. And he begged God three times to take it away. Lord, take this thorn away. I can't take it anymore. Nope. And the Bible says, of course, that the Lord didn't take his thorn away, whatever it was, to keep him what? Humble. Now, I, he probably didn't dress in a red jacket. That's not very normal. That's all, but anyway. I, I've got a thorn, and sometimes the thorn will stay there. But the Lord wants your attention. He wants you to understand that the power comes from the Holy Spirit, and that sometimes He will not take a thorn away in your life until the mission is accomplished in your heart. Amen. Mm -hmm. That's right. But I don't blame him for asking, Lord, take it away three times. And three, three times that uh, God said, man. And I'm glad it wasn't specified. Because my thorn is different than yours. So we all have a thorn. And he says, brethren, I, this is, this is, I'm going to say brethren and sister. It just says brethren and my. Can I say brethren and sister? Mm -hmm. Okay. Brethren and sister. <laughs> he says, watch him now. I do not regard myself as having laid a hold of it. Yet, yeah. mm -hmm. yet, you will, when you die and see Christ, be like Christ forever and ever. You're going to get that when you die and see Christ. You're going to be like Christ. I tell people down at the seniors when they have walkers coming in, and we'll stand with them. I said, I got good news for y'all as a Christian. When you die, there's no walkers in heaven. Right. Amen. There's no emergency room in heaven. Right. There's no pills in heaven and doctors in heaven. There's no walkers in heaven. There's no all that in heaven. So let's shout hallelujah because before you know it, you're going to get there. Yeah. Amen. And you're going to be like Christ for eternity. What a great thing to love you perfectly like Christ loves you perfectly. He showed His perfect love on the cross bearing our sin dead in full. And He showed that He loved for God so loved the world. And so, I'll be able to love y'all like Christ loves us in a perfect environment in heaven. Isn't that wonderful? That's something to look forward to. Amen. I can't love you perfect now. I'm flawed, flawed, flawed. But I'm doing my best. And the Lord knows if you're doing your best, I always say, if you're doing the right thing, keep on doing the right thing. If you're not doing the right thing, start doing the right thing. Amen. And he says, brethren and sisters, I don't regard myself of God knowing it all. And he knew a lot. And God gave him a lot of power. The Holy Spirit gave him a lot of power to raise the dead, cast out demons, form churches. And he says, I don't regard myself of having laid. Very humble here, wasn't he? Very humble. I mean, apostles, they had, they had an opportunity to not be so humble because they were doing some mighty works. Yeah. This was supernatural. That was a, a time of, of the Bible that apostles were uh, chosen by Jesus, and this was a special apostolic time. I'm not an apostle, and I don't know of one, and I, I, I just call myself brother. Some people call myself all kinds of stuff. Bro. Minister, pastor, I've been called apostle. I said, no, 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 no,
You know, you can be called anything. Just call, call me Ross. I mean, I'm just a, yeah. I'm just a voice crying out in the wilderness. But I, and he says, I haven't gotten hold of it yet. But one thing, okay, there's so many things to know in this life, and he's not having gotten a hold of everything that God wants him to know, and he hasn't done all the things that God wants him to do. And sometimes he says, you know what? I still fall short of the glory of God as an apostle of God. Apostles still sin. John the Baptist still sinned. There was one only that did not sin in word, thought, and deed. And that's why Jesus could pay the sacrifice for your sin in full. Amen. In full. Amen. Somebody said, uh, what does that mean? Pay your sin debt in full. Well, that's a good question. I was trying to think of an analogy. How many of you owned credit cards before? Okay. It, you don't have to tell me. I mean, this is the voluntary. <laughs> How many of you maxed out? A couple of credit cards. If you're, you're gonna have it. I'm the only one that's maxed out. <laughs> <laughs> I got a go. You, 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 you have maxed out. I'm with you, Ross. Mm -hmm. Okay, here's the thing. Paying your sin debt in full means this: that you will, if you die as a Christian, you will not have to pay your sin debt. Now, paying your sin debt in full after, if you die without Christ, you will, you will pay your sin debt. Or try to pay your sin debt, but you'll never get paid off. Yeah. In the meantime, you'll be tortured for sin. That's right. yeah. You'll be punished for sin. And you know what? It's not God's will that any should perish, but yeah. all come to repentance. It's not God's will that anyone go to hell. But why are people going there? Well, well, the Bible says they love their sin too much. You know the reason I didn't become a Christian until when I did? I like I like sin too much, man. <laughs> Saying, I, I knew about Jesus. Most people know about Jesus. But they, they don't know Him. They know of Him. So as I try to get through this, He says, but one thing I do know. That's comforting to know. He does know one thing. This is the hill he'll die on. This is the hill he'll die on. This is what He does know. He says, but one thing I do know. Forgetting what lies behind. Say forget about it. You see those gangster movies sometimes? Forget about it. Forget about it. And he says, forget about your past. You know why he did it? Because I believe that the, the devil, the adversary, that just like you in your life, wants to bring up the past of things you've done when God has forgiven you of those things. Don't let the devil bring up the past when God has forgiven you of that stuff. And I guarantee you, the devil, or your old friends, that said, oh, just one more time. Mm -hmm. They're going to say, hey, remember? Remember the past? Yeah. I guarantee it'll happen. And he obviously had some issues. I think here he was thinking about Stephen. Yeah. I think he was thinking about Stephen. He's the one that collected all the coats yeah. from the people when Stephen was in the middle of the town square mm -hmm. and God opened up the heavens to Stephen. Stephen was not an apostle, but he did the miracles of an apostle. And I believe when the apostle Paul was around there before he became a Christian, yeah. he collected all the coats from people while Stephen was in the middle so they could throw the rocks harder. If I take this coat off, I can throw a better fastball. You see what I'm saying? Amen. I think that's what he was thinking about. I think the devil wanted to say, remember you stood around and watched Stephen being stoned? Well, that was before he was a Christian. Yeah. And so when somebody wants to bring up your past, remember where you went before you? Yeah, I know a lot. I know all that stuff. Playing in the pool halls, man. Or other places I will not mention. You know what my greatest sin is I've ever done? I ain't going to tell you. So, <laughs> <laughs> ain't nothing, you know. That's between me and you and Fed's post. But he says, one thing I do know, and this is the encouraging part as a Christian, please be encouraged. Forgetting what lies behind, just forget about the old stuff that God has forgiven you yeah, of. Right. And don't let the devil try to steal your joy. Yeah. Because you know what? He can't steal your salvation. Because uh -uh. God gave you salvation and it's a free gift. But he can try to take away your joy by bringing up stuff that God has forgiven you of. Don't let him do it. Right. Don't let him do it. And I believe that he was probably thinking of Stephen. Forgetting what lies behind. He did some bad things. He was persecuting Christians. And reaching forward to what lies ahead. The Greek word for reaching forward is straining, stretching. Okay, put your arm out. Just casually. Now do a little strain. Ooh. Gained a couple inches on that. 
And he was, a, he was a sports fan because he realized that exercising your spiritual muscles, just that little extra strain, can get you to what you're reaching for. And when you're straining on something to try to grab something, you cannot look over your shoulder and be concentrating on what you're trying to grab onto. That's right. You know, he fall, something falls behind the sofa, and you, you look back there, and you just see it, and, you're, and you strain. You're not looking up at the ceiling. If you're straining to what's ahead and what God has for you and He's got wonderful things for you, you strain a little bit more because if you strain, you can't look back. Amen. Hallelujah to that. Amen. He says, I'm going to strain and reach forward to what lies ahead. This is what I know that I have to do. i got to highlight it in my Bible. Isn't that great encouragement? Amen. And He says, another thing for us to do, I press on toward the goal. This is it. This is this gets really, really good. I press on toward the goal for the prize. Oh my word. Amen. Let me tell you what this is. He says, I'm gonna press on, I'm gonna strain on toward the goal. What is the goal in your life today as a Christian? If you're a Christian today, here's your goal. Your goal is to be more like Christ. Yeah. More like him every day. That's your goal. And he says, that's what I'm pressing for. Not to be rich, not for the new Cadillac, but to be more like Christ. That's the goal. Amen. Now, guess what the prize is? He says, I press on toward the goal for the prize. That's, that's the cookie. Guess mm -hmm. what the prize is? Mm -hmm. To be like Christ yeah. Amen. in heaven. Mm -hmm. That's the prize, that's the crown, right? I mean, that's what it's all validated. Faith, hope, and love. Faith, I won't need any anymore when I get to heaven. You know, my faith is validated. My faith that I needed on earth in the sin fallen world, I needed faith every day to stay in the Word, to do what it means. But when I get to heaven, my faith is validated. You know, you get your validated parking stamp, you don't have to pay for it. It's done. Hope, I won't need any more hope because my hope is validated. One thing that would last forever in faith, hope, and love, love. Amen. Love will last forever and it'd be perfect. Yeah. I can't wait. I'm 59 years old at this time, and I was 25 one time. Can you believe that? Can you believe that? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> on you, I see something out of the on the other side. That's the uh, amen corner over there. But I'm closer to heaven than I was. That's right. I'm, I'm real close to heaven because our life is just a yep. blink, blink your eye. Just do that. Blink, blink your eye. That's, that's your life to God. Mm -hmm. So, your goal today, and my goal, is through my flaws, and through my shortcomings, and yes, I do sin. I don't want to, though. You know, the difference between a Christian that's indwelt by the Holy Spirit, and a Christian that's professing to be a Christian, when they sin, it doesn't bother them. Mm -hmm. Promise you that. If you're sinning and it doesn't bother you, and your conscience is not activated, you need batteries in that smoke detector. Yeah. Smoke detector right there. Mm -hmm. Now I guarantee you that if something happens on this stove and it fills up with smoke, which I call sin, your conscience will go off. Yeah. It, it keeps you from burning your house down. Mm -hmm. But you know what? I have one in my house and I kind of burnt things a little bit too much. And I was tired of that. <coughs> and see, by the way, the, the noise is not like, ding dong. <laughs> Your house is burning down. <laughs> that's not what it is. It's an a, a obnoxious sound that's going to say, you're in trouble. Yeah. Get the problem fixed. And I got so so tired of hearing it, I was I said, you know what? I, I'm always here and all that, making excuses for it. The conscience is, is uh, the smoke detector is your conscience. The smoke is sin. When you sin, your conscience just like, don't do it. Don't do it anymore. Mm -hmm. Repent and, and forget about it, but don't do it anymore. So I would take the batteries out. Just to detest it. Just to let it go. So it go, eh, eh, eh. It go, eh, eh, eh. Keep your, keep your conscience really, really strong. Yeah. Your conscience, and it's not talked about much in the Bible, is the greatest courtroom of all time. Because you know what? Your conscience won't lie to you. It will reward you when you're doing right, and it will tell you when you're doing wrong. Have a, keep a strong conscience. And he said the goal 
is to be more like Christ. The prize is to be like Christ. The upward call of Christ in Christ Jesus. It's all about Jesus Christ, isn't it? Yeah. And I'll call it two more verses. Let us therefore, as many has, are perfect. He was a little sarcastic here. I like the Apostle Paul. Don't you, Pastor? Yeah. He, he's a little sarcastic. You read his writings, he, he likes to jab a little bit. He twists his words, and there's lots of uh, theological terms you could use for it. But he says, he says, let us therefore as many are perfect. He's really being sarcastic in a way. Positionally in Christ, you may perfect in the sight of God. If not, you're not. He's talking about these people that think they can obtain spiritual perfection while in a sinful body. So he kind of says, wait a minute, I'm positionally perfect, but I'm far from being perfect. And that's why he used the word. He said, oh, all y'all people think you're perfect? Well, you might be in trouble if you're thinking that because that is not true. And a person is humble in their Christian experience and knows they have flaws and shortcomings and they fall short. We're all like sheep that have gone astray. Yes, we are like sheep that have gone astray. See, the shepherd says, eat this grass over here. And me, as a little shepherd, I just like, oh, that looks good over here. And the shepherd knows that that grass is bitter. This grass is for good. So you may have to wander. You may have to eat the bitter grass and have all the upset stomach and learn your lesson when the shepherd says, I know you wandered off, but I'm going to come and get you back because I'm going to get one and leave the 99 behind. So we all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. In Jesus Christ, we're made perfect. But he says, you guys that think you can obtain spiritual perfection, you have this attitude. And if, if anything you have different attitude, this is what he says, God will reveal it to you also. See, he gives them a break. He says, you really think you can obtain spiritual perfection on this earth in this sin-fallen body, in this sin-fallen world? He says, God will reveal it to you if you really want to know about it. So we don't push, we don't point fingers at people. He said, God's going to reveal you that this is not possible, but... You should be, if you're a Christian, press on to know Christ better. The Pharisees and the Gnostics and all these other pagan religions, they didn't want to be like Christ. Right. He wanted to be like Christ. Yeah. He did. And he knew his flaws. He knew where God had taken him. He was on his way to do some really bad things to Christians. And he says he's done some things that are just too... too, too uh, Hard to even mention. And I have done things in my life, and there's no there's no unforgivable sin here today. Right. There's no unforgivable sin. If it is, then grace is not sufficient. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We're in trouble. Mm -hmm. If there's not if there's an unforgivable sin, we're in trouble. And so everybody has an opportunity to know the Lord and everybody has an opportunity. What I love about the Lord, He doesn't want anyone to go to hell. He said hell was not created for us anyway. Right. He says it's my will that all come to repentance. We don't use that word much. Mm -hmm. Repentance. Oh, come to, come to Jesus and all your problems will be solved. But they don't talk about repentance. A preacher that doesn't mention repentance is not a real good preacher. You're not knowing what the Bible says. You've got to repent first and put your faith in Christ. Right. Yeah. Repentance not, it's just not a change of direction. It's a change in attitude yeah. towards sin. I got to think about sin like God thinking. He hates it. Yeah. He hates it. He hates it. I hate sin. I hope you hate sin if you're a Christian because God hates it. And you know what? He didn't just crucify His Son on the cross. He did that. He, but He put His Son through the ultimate torment of emotional, mm -hmm. physical, he hated sin so much that He punished sin through His own Son's sinless body. Yeah. That's hating sin. He didn't just crucify Him. See, the Apostle Paul got his head chopped off. You know what? Beep! That's, you're done. Yeah. Nothing, nothing there. No suffering, not, not a whole lot of suffering. But God wanted to make sure that we understand how significant His grace is and how significant dying in your own sins may be. And if there's anybody here that says, you know what? I've grown up in church and um, I got slipped through the cracks. I call it spiritual crack slippers. They stay in church. They grew up in church. I talk to them all the time. I grew up in church all the time. 
I said, really? Okay, and where would you go? Oh, I'm going to heaven, I'm sure. My daddy was a deacon. <laughs> really? Is that, where's that say? Where is that in the Bible? Your daddy has to be a deacon for you. The guy, I was witnessing one guy, I used, y'all can have these tracks. I got the little tracks I'll give you. I had one out and just be friendly, be friendly, you know, be friendly, smile. Here's the track. What's on the back? Oh, it's a good message. Bye, see you later. He says, um, I stopped him. I gave him one. He said, "What's this?" I said, it's, "It tells you how to get to heaven. Are you going to heaven?" He says, "He says I'm not. I'm not interested in that. I believe. I believe in Jesus and all that." He said, "But God doesn't know how I feel. How can I? How can I trust a God that doesn't know how I feel right now with all my problems?" This is when I get into my. Yeah. This is when I get into my pet, my compassionate mode. Say, I'm not. I'm not the preacher anymore. I just went up and said, "Can I just tell you something?" that maybe you don't know? And he says, sure, I got his attention. Being friendly, I'm an evangelist, just friendly, friendly, friendly. Got to strike up a conversation. And if they don't reciprocate, you walk on them. He says, he said, God can, he, I'm going through so much, God can never know how I feel. With all my troubles, I said, I have this really good news for you. He knows how you feel more than you know how you feel yourself. Amen. Because he became a man and he dwelt among us full of grace and truth. He came in the flesh, 100% God, 100% man. He never stopped being God to become man. That's right. So God knows every emotion, every feeling, everything that you're going through. God knows it even more than you do because He created you in His own image. Right. Hallelujah. I'll get back to Costco on myself. <laughs> And I'll close for the third time. <laughs> you know, no clock in here, so I mean, that's y'all's problem. Y'all's problem, not mine. Um, I, and I will. It says, um, he just said these people think they're going to be perfect, and that's not right. He admitted his flaws. He, 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 he gives us encouragement to be, what is our goal? What our goal should be is to, to grow in our walk. Grow. Growing. It's just growing, growing in a wall. You know what? If you're in the if you're in the nursery after 20 years of being a Christian, something ain't right. Amen. I talk to them, I'm around mothers all the time, and babies all the time, and sticky diapers all the time, and built bottles all the time. And the analogy I see is that you go to the nursery and get your child, but what about 10 years you go to the same nursery and get your child and they haven't even grown up yet? Something's not right. So when you read the Word, it's the milk that you need to grow spiritually. And hopefully you read it as much as you can. Somebody said, I, I just don't know where to start. Hey, start somewhere. That's right. Pick, pick a spot. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. I just open it up. I have a secret for you. I have 18 gazillion Bibles. Maybe you don't. Maybe you do. I have one open in every room. <laughs> It's it kind of like if I'm busy washing dishes or whatever, and I have an open Bible, I just got, oh, that's Proverbs, and I read a few scriptures like that, and I'm like, I meditate on that all day. I got one in the bathroom. Yeah, I do. My magazine rack kind of thing. And then <laughs> uh, the bedroom, my kitchen. Just, you know, make, yourself, make it easy for yourself. Mm -hmm. And somebody said to me, oh, I don't know what to pray. I said, find a prayer in the Bible. Yeah. They're full of prayers. They're full of people that you can relate to. And so relate to somebody that's going through the same thing, whether you're a woman or a man. There's somebody in the Bible that's experienced exactly what you have experienced in your life. So get back into what God has put in place for us to grow. And he says, if anything or different attitude, God will reveal it to you. However, let us keep living by the... This is good. Now, he's, he's, he's a pastor now. He's a preacher. He's going to say, do this, don't do that. He says that the last, and I'll close with 16. However, let us keep living. Yeah. Amen. Don't, let's, let's say this out loud. Don't give up. Don't give out. And don't give in. Is that good? Is that good? Yes. He says, however, you might have some problems. Again, being a Christian doesn't immune you to the problems of the world. I've been in more emergency rooms as a Christian than I ever did as a regular guy. And you know what? It, it's, it's humbling. Yeah. Amen. And I've, I've had church with nurses in the emergency room yeah. with my backside hanging out of those, 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 those little gowns. They're not very flattering. And uh, now my last visit was food poisoning. How many of you had food poisoning before? 
oh my, you think you're gonna die. Mm -hmm. And I was de I had three bottles of fluid I had to go. I was dehydrated to the max. And so I had the, the gown, you know, that open back. And I'm just, she's, she's, you know, ministering to me and, and I'm just kind of like trying to, you know, go around like this, like, you know, just, she goes, honey, I've been, in, I've been a nurse for 25 years. I'm just going to give you some encouragement so you can relax a little bit. I've seen a few in my time. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. I've had some the, the, the closest experiences of my life in, in some of the worst circumstances of my, of my life. I've been closer to God in those storms of life. You're going to go through some. You're going to come out of some. And you're going to be in some. But that's what I want to do. I want to know Christ better. And if it takes me to go through the storm, let it be so. Let it be so. And I've, I've, I've gotten closer to God through all my trials and all my tribulations. I've seen Him clearly because when you're down and you're out, you're going to depend on Him more and that's really wants what He wants. He wants a closer relationship. Just a closer walk with Thee. I'm not, I'm not a singer. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a preacher. There you go. <laughs> However, let us just keep say keep living. Say it. Keep living. Keep living. Say keep living. keep living. And that's what we need to do. And when you fall, get up. Yeah. Say, Lord. He says He lifts up those who are bowed down and He picks up those who are humble and hard. He will pick you up when you fall. Let Him pick you up. I, I saw, uh, Google it. I saw a race. And Apostle Paul, he loves like a, she said, like a boxer. You know, swing. He said, don't be like a boxer swinging at nothing. It's a waste of energy. It doesn't do anything any good. He said, when you train, you want your, you want your hits to make, to make a deal. And he wants your efforts in, in, in your walk, Christian walk to mean something. He was a big fan of the, the, the head of uh, Olympic type thing then. And I saw on Google one time about this guy that ran the mile and he fell down the first lap. He fell down. And I went like, he tripped and he fell. Well, these guys are uh, the you know pro runners, man. These guys, I'm sure in his mind, if it was me and I tripped from the first lap, and these people are running the pros or to get the, get the, uh, the best in the world, I would think I'm done. There's no way I can finish this race. And then what happened? He got up and he gained a few seconds each lap, and he strained. As we said in the first, he strained toward what was head. He didn't look back because I guarantee you a runner that runs a mile or a sprint will not look at his feet when he runs. He will not look at his friends in the stand and he will not look at the back and say, who's behind me? He's going to look straight forward and I want him to finish the race. Because right. yep. you can't run, you can't, you can't be, you know, that's not going to work. And this guy... He didn't win, but man, he finished strong. Yeah. And he had fallen. Glory to God. Amen. I want to finish this race strong. I want to forget those things which are behind. I want to look forward to the things that have. And if I leave this earth today, hallelujah. If I leave this earth in 30 years, hallelujah. If I leave this earth in 50 years, uh, oh my. Anyway, <laughs> that's what I'm doing. I don't know if I want to be that old. But... I hope this word, I, I'm, a pre, I'm a verse by verse preacher, as you can tell, and only about four verses, but there's a lot in that. Yeah. There's a lot in that. And so hopefully, through the word, and me trying to explain it the best I can, and not my personality or my energy, hopefully you, you heard the word, you know, not, not the cover, you know, the, you know my personality. I, I just want to be excited about God. Yeah, I do. And I want you to be excited about being a Christian too. I'm thinking here, somebody has a burden on, somebody has a burden. And I'm thinking that, this, this is what I like, just real quickly, and I know Pastor's going to close us out, but I, I, I would like us to do what is done in the Bible. I like us to put our palms up to the Lord. Just put your palms up to the Lord. Keep them open too. Why do we keep our palms open? 
Because I can't hold on to anything. Yeah. There's nothing I can hold on to. I mean, I, I can hold, if I'm holding on to something and I, it's a burden, the Lord wants me to let it go. And He wants me to send it to the throne of grace. So when you open your palms and you pray to God, God, I love you. I repent of my sins. I put my faith in Christ. And I'm going to release these burdens to you. I'm going to open my palms to you. And I pray in Jesus' name, please take this burden that I'm carrying and take it and I give it to you. I surrender to you these burdens. Now, if it be your will, Lord, and you want to send me back a blessing and put them in my palms, so to speak, spiritually, make sure I close them and hold on tightly to that blessing and put it in my spiritual pocket for another day. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you all for listening. Yeah.